like to ask you all here in this room a question. How many have heard that Israel's territory uh, in any way uh, is violating international law? Has anyone heard, heard that, in, that Israel, that they're illegal settlements? Yeah, yeah. All right. How many people in the room actually think that Israel does have illegal settlements or that they're violating international law with their territory? One, okay. Anyone else? Two, anyone else? Okay, so now I'll ask the same question that I asked in Brussels. You think they're probably violating international law? Yes. All right, which one? Um, 151. 151? One one? Uh, that's, uh, no, 222. 222. I don't remember the number, but that's the... Uh, uh, the, uh, that's the resolution. That's the resolution, right. Okay, but that's after the State of Israel. After the State of Israel? Yeah, 222. 222 was after 67. Right, and they're, they're all right. And uh, w w what do you think is the law that they're by? That's not international law as much as a, as a UN resolution. Well, uh, actually not. Um, the, um, the General Assembly, when it makes a, uh, like, 181, which I'll discuss, is different from the Security Council. So when the UN makes a resolution, it's not binding. It's suggestive. Just like when the Senate makes a resolution, it's suggestive. Only when the Security Council makes a resolution does it have the force of law. Let's ask this gentleman. What law do you think, it, what m part of international law is being violated? One side, it sounds like an encroachment. Encroachment on what? Uh, the lands might be set aside for uh, Palestinians. If I'm wrong, correct me, please. Okay. So let's talk about the land. First, we all know that in biblical times, Israel was known as Judea, correct? And uh, when the Romans uh, expelled the Jews, they uh, changed the name of the land from Judea to Palestine, correct? And the word Palestine means? I have no idea. No idea. Oh, the Philistines. Philistines. The Philistines. Right. They changed the name of the land to the greatest enemy of the Jews, the Philistines. In addition, they um, they um, uh, denuded it of any independence or as a, an independent nation, and they attached it to Syria, and they called it Syria-Palestina. So the Romans ruled Palestine as Syria-Palestina, as a uh, southern province or part or region of Syria. Now let's move ahead, and let's talk about the next guys who have an important role, and that's the Ottoman Empire, that's the Turks. Does everyone in the room know what the Ottoman Empire was? Does anyone not know what the Ottoman Empire was? All right, anyone has heard of Turkey? Before it was Turkey, it was the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire ruled on three continents, uh, Africa, Asia, and Europe, for approximately let us say, in the case of Palestine, about 440 years. And um, the Sultan owned all the land. And in the mid-19th uh, century, let us say, uh, specifically April 28th, uh, 1858, somewhere around there, uh, there were a series of land reforms and um, individual rights that were installed, and they allowed people for the first time in the Ottoman Empire to register their land as land that they owned. And that means that if they owned a piece of land, by whatever right, they could register it in the uh, deeds office the same way you might register your land in the, uh, in the county office of deeds. And in order to have that uh, uh, right, they had to work the land, live on the land, uh, own the land, or have some other attachment to the land 
and the 400 and some page uh, Ottoman Land Registration Act, which I have a copy of in English, and there are very few in the world, stipulated the same types of rules and regulations that we have here in New Jersey, that we have here in Maryland. It was actually based on English law, and it said there were several categories, and one of those categories was that if land was abandoned, uh, left fallow, um, um, uh, not worked, then it is cheated back to the state. So that meant that a person, uh, let's say an Arab, uh, could not just stand um, in the valley and say, I see all these hilltops around me and say, these are mine. He had to have some connection to those. And does everybody in the room know what is cheated back to the state means? Any lawyers in the room? Anyone who was formerly married to a lawyer? This guy was married. <laughs> OK. All right. Here, m move up here a little bit. You're doing a good job. You're raising your hand with a lot of questions. All right. You can't touch the mic. Uh, what is cheated? Uh, it's cheated means it, uh, if, uh, under certain circumstances, land can uh, uh, be, uh, go back to the government if it's uh, not in use. Sovereign land. Sovereign land. Okay, now does everybody know that if you don't put $5 in your savings account from time to time, it's going to go back to the... Now, here in Jersey, I understand it's a long time. In, in Maryland, where I'm from, it's just one year. So we have to make sure we put $5 in our savings account or it, uh, it gets us cheated back to the state within a year. <clears throat> okay, now where did the Arabs mainly live in the uh, land of the mid-19th century that um, Mark Twain said was uh, almost deserted in uh, many parts. They lived mainly in the valleys. That means these were the places where the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the herds could be tended, the crops could be um, harvested, uh, it was green, there was water there, it w uh, they had streams, and this was where habitation took place. Where they didn't settle was they didn't settle uh, up on the hilltops, gen ge generally speaking, not always, because the hilltops were not arable. You could not grow stuff up there. They were rocky. They were unusable. So when the, after 10 years of non-use, this land went back to the Sultan, back to the Ottoman Empire as what they called public lands waste or wastelands or other lands not needed for public purposes, okay? That's the Ottoman Land Registration Act. Now, has anyone in the room actually heard before this moment of the Ottoman Land Registration Act? Yes. No. You have, right? And you have. Okay. So now uh, we move about 20 years after the Ottoman Land Registration Act, and uh, Turkey, meaning the Ottoman Empire, passes the Vilayet Law, the Law of the Vilayets, and it now has administrative districts, and those administrative districts are, include Syria and Palestine, or Syria-Palestina, along the Roman uh, model, is part of that. Moving on, so now we're into the uh, good 1870s, and moving a few years more, we discover that we have a new phenomenon, or a building phenomenon, in the world called self-determination. Has anyone, has everybody in the room heard of self-determination? You've heard of self-determination? You've heard of self-determination? And that means that individuals, based on their uh, common religion, their common geographic location, their common language, whatever they think binds them together, whether it's the fact that they're speaking a certain language or they're living between the two valleys, they could self-determine their own af affairs instead of being dictated to by uh, ecclesiastical, dynastic, and monarchical regimes in the far-off em far empires. And this, of course, self-determination goes into the, brings up the uh, corollary issue of nationalism. Nationalism means people wanted to make their own national 
destiny, destiny and not be ruled by the far-off dictators, either whether it was the Tsar or whether it was the Ottoman Empire, the Sultan. So now, many groups are looking for self-determination. Uh, that would be the Greeks, the Hungarians, the Armenians, and the Jews wanted self-determination, and there was Jewish nationalism. And Jewish nationalism created what? What? Zionism. That is the two-word definition for uh, Zionism is Jewish nationalism. In fact, at the time that Jewish nationalism arose, in the late 1990s, nine, in, uh, excuse me, 1890s, say uh, 1897 when the first Zionist Congress was called, uh, they weren't even sure it would be Palestine that they would be uh, self-determining their uh, national aspirations in. As you know, many locations were under consideration. Uh, Palestine was always the very f top of them, but others were determined. Now, many people think that it was, in fact, uh, the advent of Herzl and Judenstadt, his, uh, his uh, book for a Jewish state, or um, it was the a push of modern Zionism that actually was the main engine for this movement. Actually, the big engine did not occur in 1897. It occurred in 1903. And in 1903, we have the Kishnev pogrom. Has everybody in the room heard of the Kishnev pogrom? You've heard of the Kishnev pogrom? Yes. Um, this is uh, a pogrom that happened in Russia or usually Ukraine. It was, it was in Eastern Europe. It's hard to say what was Russia and what was not Russia because the lines were going back and forth. This was the very first, very first pogrom, and there were many, the very first pogrom which had ever been um, uh, broadcast to the world immediately. Kishnev, K-I-S-H-N-E-V, Kishnev. And K-I-S-H-N-E-V, you like N-I-V? I-N-E-V. I-N-I-V, Kishinev, okay. I suppose it depends um, what part of Poland you've been brought up in. Um, so um, this was broadcast to the world, this terrible atrocity. There were hundreds of pogroms. But in this particular pogrom, which was an Easter pogrom, uh, uh, the Jewish victims had their stomachs ripped open and stuffed with pillows. Uh, they were burned, there were rapes, there were all sorts of bloody um, elements of a massacre. And this was all broadcast around the world due to a brand new communications um, a modality. And the name of that communications modality was what? Radio. Radio. No. Try again. Newspaper. Newspaper. No. Try again. Telegram. Telegram. You're getting closer. Try again. Telegraph. Telegraph. No. Wire service. First wire service. And the name of that first wire service was? Reuters. Reuters, correct. Reuters wire service. So all of a sudden, the whole world, meaning all the, news, all, all the newspapers suddenly, and of course then they sent their own journalists in, could document this atrocity. And many people began to see that the Jews who uh, uh, were not wanted in Russia, were being massacred in Russia, needed a homeland of their own. And this plugged into the concept of Zionism, which modern Zionism had been born um, some years before at the end of the, of the 19th century. And it's an interesting side note that one of the groups that was um, moved uh, to help the Jews was the Chinese Benevolent Society of San Francisco, Chicago, and New York. The Chinese also through Manchuria and some of their um, uh, kinfolk were also fighting the Tsar, so they had a natural affinity to the tragedy of the Jews. They uh, donated money, they sent uh, relief help, and actually in New York on one Christmas Eve, they invited all the Jewish, main Jewish leaders to join them for a Chinese meal in a Chinese restaurant called Chinese Delmonico's. 
And these Jewish leaders didn't really, couldn't read the Chinese menu, and they, they, so they just ordered by number, one, three, four. And ever since that time, the Jews have been going to Chinese restaurants on Christmas. <laughs> you know, when you do this kind of research, uh, you leave out 99% of what you find, and uh, this is one of the 99% I decided not to leave out. <laughs> now, it's interesting. All the stuff I'm giving you about international law does not appear in the book, Financing the Flames, which you saw on, uh, w which is uh, my most recent bestseller. This is the research I had to do to be prepared to understand the issues confronting Israel and NGOs was to become conversant with the realities of international law. Okay, so uh, now we're moving ahead and uh, from 1903 and we get to 1908. 1908 we see the advent of Arab nationalism and that is done through the Young Turk movement. Has everyone heard of the Young Turks? The concept of the Young Turks? These were Young Turks, uh, Turkish soldiers, uh, influenced by the French Christian um, uh, leadership that they encountered in Lebanon and Syria. Lawrence. And, pardon me? Lawrence. Lawrence comes in later. And, we'll, uh, and I will take questions from everybody after this is done. So, um, uh, they also wanted their national aspirations. They wanted an Arab state, uh, since, of course, uh, the Turks were not Arabs and uh, had a lot of conflict with the Arabs. And they wanted that, they were determined to create an Arab state in what part of the world? In the Middle East. Middle East, where? Uh, Syria. Syria, correct. They wanted the Arab state to be in Syria, in Damascus, which was the center of gravity for the, um, uh, for, for the Arab world, and of course, uh, Hussein, who was the uh, um, Sharif of Mecca, and his son Faisal, who participated in this Lawrence of Arabia story that is 81% accurate that you've seen in the movies, um, attacking the trains in exchange for what they thought would be their national rights in Syria. Now we're moving into World War I. 1914 and beyond. And uh, now Germany is at war with France and England and of course their allies. And who is allying with, um, uh, with Germany? Turkey. Turkey, correct, the Ottoman Empire. That means that the Ottoman Empire is now at war with the Western allies. So immediately, uh, uh, almost Im immediately, the Turkish authorities decide to exterminate all the Jews of Palestine because, of course, they thought they were enemies of the state in the same way that they thought the Armenians were enemies of the state. In the case of the Armenians, uh, 1.4, 1.5 million Ar 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 Armen Armenians were systematically uh, massacred and murdered on death marches in the first genocide of the 20th century. Um, it's hard to use the word genocide since the word didn't exist until 1942, but you understand what I mean. Uh, they were murdered along the railway lines um, established by the Berlin to Baghdad Railway Agreement between Germany and Iraq. And in large measure, it was observed and supervised, um, at least from afar, by certain German officials. Now, the Jews were not exterminated in Palestine, but many of them were deported. All of this uh, led the Allies to believe that when they won the war against the Ottoman Empire, they would dismantle the Ottoman Empire. They would, um, they, they considered the um, uh, the Ottomans to be, quote, the terrible Turk. And the headlines in the New York Times and the Washington Post was, we're going to carve up Turkey. That's, where, that's what the headlines were. 
And so they decided that the colonies and territories and possessions of the Ottoman Empire would be um, uh, given up to self-determination groups. Ironically, one of those groups was, uh, that wanted self-determination was Armenia. Uh, the Armenians didn't get it because we were supposed to have the mandate for Armenia and we never joined the League of Nations. And that is why uh, we never had the mandate. So, there was a, um, as the war is coming to a close in the latter phases of the war in 1917, what began 20 years earlier in uh, 1897 as Jewish nationalism, as national movements across the board are being readied to assume their own destiny, um, there, something is published by the major governments in, 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 the, in the world. And this document is called what? The Balfour, Decla the Balfour, Balfour Declaration. Declaration. Right. That's a slightly different story. It involves different countries like Iraq and Syria. And so have you heard of the Balfour Declaration? Yeah. Have you heard of the Talat Declaration? No. Anyone in the room heard of the Talat Declaration? Everybody has heard of the Balfour Declaration. Yeah. Well, what is not known is that this one letter from the Foreign Office to um, one individual in the Jewish community uh, expressing British uh, policy was just a simple piece of paper. But this same policy was expressed at that same time by the Woodrow Wilson letter, the French letter, the German letter, and even the Pasha Talat Declaration of 1917 that also said, we welcome the Jews making Palestine their homeland. And of course, they would always say, in addition to the local inhabitants uh, being allowed, uh, not being disturbed. But the point is, these were not just one piece of paper from Balfour, this was uh, an international policy decision taken by um, all the major factors in World, in, 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 in world War I. That led to something called the San Remo Convention. Now, when I was in Brussels, I asked a European, I asked a European parliament experts, not just ordinary legislators, and parliamentarians, experts on Palestine, what law Israel was violating? And they said, we don't know. And then I said, where does international law begin in Israel and the Palestinian territory? And nobody knew. And then I said, has anyone heard of San Remo? And one guy said, you mean mineral water? Okay, World War I ends, peace conference begins, the remapping of Europe and other parts of the world commences, the Arabs are sitting at the peace conference attempting to get Syria as their national Arab state, Faisal is in attendance, the British say okay, the French say not okay, and on March 24th, 1920, we have the bedrock of international law in that part of the world called the San Remo Convention. This international law for these purposes, without uh, going into the uh, UN Security Council, is created when a treaty is signed multilaterally by numerous countries. And in this case, the San Remo Convention was adopted by 59 nations. Not only was it adopted by the 59 leading nations of the world, it was ratified in the United States by both houses of Congress unanimously. And I believe, just as a coincidence, I happen to have that resolution of ratification. Would you examine it? Tell me what 
what year it uh, came out. <laughs> 19 when? 22. 1922, correct. So now we have a convention called the San Remo Convention, which says that uh, the Jews will be allowed to establish their homeland in Palestine, along with the other groups that are already there. It is not only accepted by 59 nations, ultimately, it becomes part of the League of Nations and is woven into the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, given by the international community to Britain, and is the law of the land each and every day for years and goes right through and applies and is the law the governing law, not the forgotten law, right through World War II. Now, through a strange coincidence, I happen to have a copy of the San Remo Convention here. And I'm going to ask uh, Fern to please show it up on the screen. And I will ask somebody to read, as an example, Article 6. Article 6 of the San Remo Convention. The administration of Palestine, while ensuring that the rights and position of other sections of the population are not prejudiced, shall facilitate Jewish immigration under suitable conditions and shall encourage, in cooperation with the Jewish agency referred to in Article 4, close settlement by Jews on the land. Did you say close settlement close. by Jews on the land? I said close settlement by Jews on the land, including state lands and wastelands, not required for public purposes. Correct. Well, it says state lands and wastelands not needed for public purposes under international law. That refers to the Ottoman Land Registration Act of April 28th, 1858, which specified that lands which were not actually worked, owned, tilled, operated, would escheat back to the state, become public lands, and would either be state lands or waste lands that were not uh, 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 needed for public purposes. In other words, they would be empty lands, and these were mainly the hilltops. Now, you made reference, it says in here, Article 6, that... Um, this was to be um, uh, um, made efficient through a Jewish agency referred to in Article 4. Did you not say that? I did. All right, let's go to Article 4. The name of the agency under international law designated by 59 nations, by the League of Nations, by both houses of Congress, by the League of Nations mandate of 1922 is the Zionist organization. This held right through, right through World War II. And at the end, and of course in 1937, in the middle of the Hitler regime, two years before the war broke out, uh, meaning the war in Europe, we had the Peel Commission, which of course uh, laid the groundwork for two states, for two peoples, and, of course, that created the uh, um, uh, uh, even greater violence within the Palestine area between the Arabs and the, and the Jews. And when World War II was over, the League of Nations was succeeded by what? United Nations. United Nations, correct? Everybody knows that, right? What happened to the Treaty of San Remo? Treaty of San Remo was the unfinished business of the League of Nations and was actually woven into the UN Charter. Let's go to Article 80 of the UN Charter. Read us Article 80 of the UN Charter. Except as may be agreed upon in individual trusteeship agreements made under Article 77, 79, and 81, placing each territory under the trusteeship system and until such agreements as have been concluded, 
Nothing in this chapter shall be construed in or of itself to alter in any manner the rights whatsoever of any states or any peoples. You said any states or peoples, any correct? states or any peoples of the terms of existing international instruments to which members of the United Nations may respectively be party. Okay. So now, the League of Nations mandate and the Treaty of San Remo, adopted by 59 nations, is now woven into the UN Charter in Article 80. It's not forgotten about. They remembered it. And they remembered it, and they still kept trying to find some way with the millions of, uh, of uh, Jews killed in the years before, with the uh, uh, masses of refugees, for these two communities to live side by side. That's almost the wording that they used. It, it is a pity, I believe, if the words they used, that these two communities cannot live side by side. And then, in General Assembly UN Resolution 181, we had the famous vote for partition, correct? And the General Assembly vote was not, um, was just a recommendation. There were no lines that were formulated into international law. There was suggested lines, suggested maps. In fact, in order to give the Arabs their self-determination, they cut off a complete section called Transjordan and made that a nation in the very first gasp of the mandate. And of course, they also made an Arab nation in Iraq. And that Arab nation in, in Iraq uh, had, uh, was, uh, the, the king was King Faisal, who had attended the Paris Peace Con and who had actually set up an initial government of his own in Syria. And so the concept was, once again, Syria, Palestina. In fact, the Palestinians, the Arabs, if I could use that term, did not even want any recognition for the, for the area known as Palestine because they thought as soon as they did that, and took it away from the Arab territory known as Syria-Palestina, they'd be playing the same game as the Jews, as the Zionists. So, Resolution 181 says, you two communities, you'll each make independent states. There'll be some economic links, there'll be some transportation links, there'll be a common cur currency, and then the rest is history. The Jews said, we will make our state, and the Arabs said, you will never make your state. And can we get uh, a map of Gaza up? Oh, we don't have it, okay. Okay, so then, um, Israel was uh, the Jews were invaded on six sides. Jordan took um, uh, um, the um, area known as the West Bank of the Jordan River. Gaza was taken over by the Egyptians. An Arab state or a Palestinian state was not created. They were absorbed. They were occupied. Moving forward, we have the Six-Day War. Nasser tried to um, uh, lead a coalition of Arab countries to uh, push the Jews into the sea. That did not work. The Jews found themselves sitting at the Suez Canal, and they found themselves sitting uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, um, in Shamran and uh, the other parts of what is now known as the West Bank. That's Gaza. And the Egyptians took Gaza, and that is Transjordan, which became Jordan, and they took what is now commonly referred to as the West Bank. So that means in 1967, when the Jews found themselves in the same place that they had argued about getting in the first place, the West Bank, they found that they were in 
the former, the disputed territory of the former Turkish colony called Syria Palestina. That's where they were. That there had been a sovereignty vacuum. There was sovereignty limbo going back to the end of World War I when these uh, territories were uh, uh, detached on three continents from uh, the Ottoman Empire, which now was reduced to something called Turkey. And in order for them to occupy the highlands, the hills, any area, they had to observe the status quo ante and international law, which meant they had to observe the pre-existing illegal occupation law of Jordan, the pre-existing UN charter, the pre-existing uh, mandate for Palestine by the League of Nations, the pre-existing uh, San Remo Convention, and going back to the Ottoman Land Registration Act of April 28th when? 1858. 1858, correct. So then I said to these eminent parliamentarians, so which, which law in international law is Israel violating? And they didn't have an answer. And they said, we don't know. And these were the experts. And at the time, they, we, we had actually preceded the conversation with a discussion of SodaStream. I mean, prior to this event, this interview, I had never even heard of Scarlett Johansson. That's how out of it I am. And uh, I said, so let me get this straight. You've got a piece of land. You've got a factory that's environmentally good, environmentally clean. It's got, uh, it's a few miles over the green line. It's got a, um, uh, it's got a, uh, um, half its workforce is Arab, half its management force is Arab, equal employment, equal advancement. The Arabs are earning four or five times what they could in their own home villages. Thousands of mouths are being fed. There's a mosque on site. The, the halal food in the cafeteria is free. And that's a war crime, right? And they said, yes. And so I said, so if Mennonites from Lancaster were doing this, or Mormons from Utah, or Polish nuns, would they be up for a Nobel Peace Prize? And they said, probably. But I said, but Jews are doing it. So that makes it a war crime and a violation of international law. And then someone piped up and said, it's a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. I said, really? Which chapter? Article 49. By the strangest of coincidence, I have Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention with me. Now, I'm not going to, at this time, show you all the many Jewish newspapers that have, and many uh, organizations, uh, NGOs, who have cited this and the language. But I will quote to you from, the, uh, from what they say the law says. Listen carefully. Individual or mass transfers, as well as deportations of protected persons from occupied territory to the territory of the occupying power, et cetera, et cetera, are strictly prohibited. Individual or mass transfers. That's right. That's the words I read in the media, and they left out the word forcible. Can you read the first um, five words of the ICRC 
Fourth Geneva Convention, Article 49. Uh, oh, individual or mass forcible transfers, as well as deportations of protected persons. Right. Forcible. Where did this document come from? It came from the Tokyo Draft, written in the months before. This was written by 57 experts from the Nuremberg war crimes trials who were trying to ensure that no one ever again would transport Jews back and forth across sovereign state lines to be worked to death in concentration camps and in the cases and the case of many actually exterminated it was not designed to make a war crime giving people employment, paying them four times more, opening up a bus stop, and giving them a free hot meal. Article 49. You may all write this down. This is not stuff that I found in a basement archive in Switzerland. This is stuff that's common, ordinary knowledge. This is settled history. And most of our Jewish leaders don't know this history. Most of our professors don't teach this history. Most of our media doesn't report this history. And consequently, when I brought this up, and I said, so once again, what are these lands occupying and what is the international law that they're violating? These experts, and indeed all the ones that I've spoken to, have said, we don't know. So now does anyone in the room at this moment have an opinion of which part of international law is clearly being violated? All right, which part is that? Again, 242 and 338, but the resolution, and we have to understand that the legitimate, and I'm not saying I'm a scholar or, or lawyer yeah. or anything, I'm just saying that if we consider Resolution 181 as a legitimate right for Israel and the Palestine or the pe other people in the land to create two nation, we have to accept other United States Actually, resolutions. those two resolutions called for the word refugees. Correct. Correct. Now, anyone in the room know how many refugees were created in the years after 1948 amongst the Jews expelled penniless from the Arab countries? Anyone in the room know? Over 800,000. It's 880 approximately, correct? Correct. And these people were thrown out of their country, penniless, state, stateless, their crime was living peaceably for 2,700 years in these Arab nations, a thousand years before Muhammad, as leading citizens. They were thrown out. The necklaces were pulled from their necks. The earrings were pulled from their um, earlobes, and they were sent packing on 24-hour-a-day airlifts to Israel to create a demographic bomb. Not just in one country, in many, in, in many countries. And a highly documented legal disenfranchisement. And the name of the airline that had the 24-hour airlift that sent them to Israel. Anybody know the name of that airline? El Al, who said that? Wrong. Anyone else? Alaska Air. Alaska Air. They flew the Jews. That yeah, was Alaska Air. So they were chartered and they flew day and, day and night. And so, it's not clear and it's not clear cut. And there's a lot of different explanations and arguments about international law and who owns the land. And then somebody said, but it's Palestinian land. And I said, what year, what decade, or what century 
did it become Palestinian land? And they said, we don't know. Now, I will ask anyone in the audience, in the first decades, the first six decades of the 20th century, when you used the term Palestinian, what were you talking about, an Arab or a Jew? A Jew. The Jew. The Jews were the Palestinians. The Palestine Post, the Jewish Agency for Palestine, the Palestinian Brigade, as opposed to the Arab delegation, the Arab Committee, the higher Arab Committee. And so during all those times, even if you look at Exodus with Paul Newman, as I recently did, he says to Paul Newman, what's wrong with you Palestinians? Don't you know the Arabs are going to kill you? So, and I know that all of you know that the Jews have been, the, Israel, the people of Israel have been accused of flooding Gaza with imaginary dams that don't exist in the desert in recent days, and those articles have been retracted. So I'll just finish this way, and I only have time for one or two questions because I have to catch a train, and I was enjoying myself too much. We didn't, we didn't poison the wells in medieval time we did not use Christian blood to make matzah for Passover. The Jews did not throw the Black Sox game of 1919. <laughs> there was no Jewish conspiracy to remove the chips from chocolate chip cookies, as Henry Ford claimed in the Dearborn Independent. We didn't open the dams that don't exist to flood Gaza, as has been reported uh, and now retracted by Al, Al Jazeera and many other media. And we're not violating international law with the territory, but I'm sure that conclusion will come from a hard debate in the days to come. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And now I've got time for one or two questions. First, I'll take a question from this gentleman. Just a second. During the period of early Zionism, Third I Theodore Herzl was involved. Am I correct? Theodore Herzl was early Zionism. Early Zionism. Meaning early political Zionism. Okay. Wasn't there a point at that point when some part of the nations of the world were offering the Jews a homeland in Uganda? And if that was true, what time period are we talking about? Yes, uh, they were offering Jews uh, Uganda, Argentina, uh, many other places, and uh, and I mentioned that specifically. And Uganda was actually briefly uh, accepted. Let me take a question from here. How do you bring how do you bring this legal history um, to the media? How do you educate them so that they can provide truth? Okay, the question, camera, is how do you bring this to the media? Well, the first thing is that when somebody misquotes the Fourth Geneva Convention and Article 49 and leaves out the, uh, and leaves out the, uh, f uh, the key fourth word of forcible, and when somebody says it is now uh, clearly a violation of international law, and when somebody says that this is Palestinian land, you need to say, when did it become Palestinian land? I realize that there's a lot more I could have said, but unfortunately, I can't stand here for five hours and give it all to you. I would love, I, I would love to, to uh, do that. But um, uh, when someone says they're violating international law by employing Arabs, you say, which one? And when they say, that person may not move into that house, you say, because they're Jewish? Is that the test? Is that what, um, is that what we would allow in New Jersey to make it illegal for a Jew to move next door, or a Muslim, or a Christian, or an atheist because of his religion? Bearing in mind there's two million Arabs already living in Israel as citizens, and not only do they have their rights, they just outpolled 
the right-wing parties, and they now have, as of a few hours ago, 13 seats in the parliament. It was diminished from, from 14. So all I can do is give you the benefit of 47 years of research. Actually, 48. I hit my 65th birthday a couple days ago. And I'll leave it to the rest of you to figure out. Do I have time for one more? Absolutely. All right, I'll just, Carol, do I have time for one more? Uh, not really. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.